Hello, and welcome to today's discussion of neoclassical expression. Today, we're going to discuss neoclassical and classical expression. Classical here is specifically referring to classical music. Everything else is referring to a neoclassical style. The reason why it's called neoclassical is because classical's already been revisited. Perhaps you remember, we discussed classical forms and the revisiting of antiquity when we discussed the Renaissance. Here, they're looking back to those forms once again, but now in a different sort of expression. Classical music is called classical music because in the classical era, meaning antiquity, they did have music, but the way that it was notated and preserved was not very efficient. So we don't have many representations of what that music would actually sound like. So this is not neoclassical or new classical. It's creating music with classical ideas and structures in mind. So our goals today are to try and understand the historical context of the late 18th century. Here we'll examine the expression of revolution and neoclassical thinkers and artists. Your focus question for this lecture is why are artists and thinkers drawn once again to classical forms in this era? What's motivating them? In order to better understand that, we need to consider what fuels a revolution. So perhaps you remember from our discussions of the Baroque era and the Rococo period that the wealthy structures and powers and people were driving a lot of artistic interest and influence. And we saw that expression in Baroque extremes and drama, and we saw it further expressed in the frivolity and lightheartedness of Rococo. The discrepancy in these forms and their way of life versus the lives of average people was addressed by satirist and enlightenment thinkers, but they're addressed once again in this latter 18th century period. There is a new philosophical context for this era, and it's called rational humanism. Perhaps you remember Christian humanism as we discussed it during the Renaissance. That's where they looked back to antiqu antiquity, rediscovered humanism, or the belief that human beings can do great things, and they discovered this by looking at the great things that those classical thinkers and creators did, and then they tried to overlay Christian ideals with that, that version of humanism. Here, it's not about Christianity, but it is still about the great things that human beings can achieve. Rational humanism results in a systematic examination of society. There is an awareness, once again, of human greatness. There's so much exemplary achievement in this era and in the 18th century in general. But the world was still a mess. There were still powers that were corrupting and corruptible, and people were dissatisfied. Rational humanism calls for that recognition of the dignity of humanity. But here, instead of faith lying in God, faith lies with reason. Rational humanism is about the dignity of humanity versus the absolute monarchy. And it's about faith in the power of reason, sorry, the power of reason versus the power of religion or the power of the state. Some of the influential thinkers associated with this philosophy are Montesquieu and Rousseau. Perhaps the most influential of Montesquieu's work is The Spirit of the Laws, written in 1748. In this work, he compares different systems of government in an effort to establish underlying principles of governance. This is not unlike the sort of philosophical exploration that Aristotle did when he wrote Politics, exploring different systems of government. However, Montesquieu ends up advocating for a monarchy. He's not advocating for a monarchy in the same way that Hobbes did, however. Instead, he advocates for a monarchy where there is a distribution of powers, one where the powers are divided between the king or the monarch and other governmental bodies. This will provide checks and balances so that no one can end up with any sort of tyrannical rulership. Another influential thinker is Rousseau. And Rousseau wrote about the social contract, not unlike John Locke. He was also a contributor to the Encyclopedia, that compendium of knowledge assembled by Diderot that we discussed when we discussed the Enlightenment. Rousseau riffs off of Locke, um, going with the idea that humans are inherently good and that, in fact, it is society that is bad, so a tabula rasa of sorts. 
He thinks that the natural goodness of people has been corrupted by the growth of society. He refers to human beings as noble savages. Um, this is the idea that there is a natural man who's untouched by the corrupting elements of civilization, and that evil is really only manifest by societal stresses. Part of the reason why society is bad, according to Rousseau, is that it is superficial or artificial. He says that humans' needs for the superficial or artificial are a construct of society. Our only real needs are food, sleep, shelter, and sex for survival or procreation. These are bound to nature, though, not to society. Instead, we become slaves to our artificial needs and will start to dominate other people to fulfill those artificial needs. And because of this, people live inauthentic lives. They spend a lot of time looking one way instead of just being. Society is constraining. For instance, the idea of owning land is artificial. It's a societal construct. It's only for appearances because no one can actually own the land. He says, man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains, and he believes that human beings should not impose their will on other human beings. Instead, he has a belief in human equality, and he says that morality in a society arises when the general will of the entire community agrees that it should be that moral standard. This helps to demolish the aristocracy. Their will is not the important one because it, is not, because it is not the general will of society. This idea is later picked up by Karl Marx, and Rousseau in general is not accepted by his contemporaries, but his ideas certainly play into some of those ideas that linger in latter society. Additional historical contexts to consider are the American Revolution and the French Revolution. I'm hoping that you know something already about the American Revolution, and that it was a rebellion against King and Parliament, specifically a rebellion against British taxation. The American colonies were tired of paying for Britain's past war debts, and they rebelled. There were numerous tax schemes imposed by Britain to, to get this money from the colonies, and there were rebellions all over the colonies in the United States. It was also a rebellion against the, the British's attempts to enforce these taxations that got the colonists riled up. The colonists called in alliances from France and Spain and the Netherlands. All of these places, if you remember, were well established as sort of imperial powers on their own, and they all had beef with Great Britain, so they were very happy to help out the American colonists. This results in the writing of the Declaration of Independence. It's got an optimistic view, and it sets out a new social order. It calls for political and social freedom, and it brings up equality and justice and breaking away from tyranny. So the whole thing is essentially a breakup letter to, from America to King George. So we'll take a look at it here. In the Declaration of Independence, it says, When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them to another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. So all of that there is preamble. It's saying this has been going on for a long time, and we're feeling oppressed, but we really feel like we should let you know why before we break up with you. And here's why. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness.' 
So you can see here what's important to the colonies are safety, freedom, and happiness. Would you say that those things are still important to Americans today? What it lays out here is a pretty grand plan for itself, and it does a fine job of saying that George has stepped on those things that are important to Americans. The Declaration of Independence is written in 1776, and the American Revolution ensues. Again, it implies a universality of man and nature. So here you can see something of the colonists, the Americans, um, tenderness towards nature and, uh, and humanistic ideas. Eventually, I'm not, oh, spoilers, sorry, the Americans win the revolution, and in doing so, they write for themselves a constitution in 1787. The constitution included civil rights, and it limited the power of government, calling upon Locke and Montesquieu for inspiration. So, this is how America becomes America. And I've included the Gadsden flag here, I'm just a Ben Franklin nerd, so <laughs> I went ahead and included some trivia as well. Now, in addition to the American Revolution, we have the French Revolution. The French Revolution was absolutely inspired by the Americas. They um, are suffering from the abuse of monarchs as well, which we have studied. We studied Louis XIV, the Sun King, and all of his efforts. And then with the Rococo era, how Louis XV and Louis XVI didn't do much better. Even though they moved the government back to Paris, there were still tremendous abuses of power. Generally, they were seen to be indifferent to the suffering of French society, and they put power into the hands of aristocrats. Perhaps you remember, certain people were granted tax breaks if they paid allegiance to the king. And because of this, the French government was suffering a shortage of funding, and they were collecting that funding from the average people. The average people, by the way, were suffering from famine, from record cold temperatures. People in general were in a rough spot, and they were getting restless. Now, in addition to the monarchy, there was something called the Three Estates in France. And these three estates were made up of clergy, nobility, and then pretty much everybody else. These assemblies were um, advisory bodies to the king, and the king decided to give them some say in an effort to seem as though he was considering the needs of the people. So each estate gets one vote, and... The bigwigs, the clergy and the nobility, typically vote together. Um, they tend to win even though they have fewer numbers than the everybody else body. Louis offers to double the votes of the General Assembly, but they are pissed and they depart and create their own National Assembly. They do invite the other estates to join them, but as you can imagine, those other estates decline. The king, in an effort to stop the creation of the National Assembly, banned them from meeting at their traditional meeting place, so the National Assembly gathered on a tennis court, and there they vowed the tennis court oath. They vowed to never disband until they had created a new French constitution. Later, national party movements are stifled by military forces, but some of the military, siding with the National Assembly, refused to shoot. And if they refuse to enact the king's law on uh, behalf of the king, then those military members are imprisoned. So popular uh, political figures and military members standing up for the people end up at the Bastille. Because of this, the National Assembly and its supporters decide to storm the Bastille to free those political prisoners. The Bastille, by the way, is the most imposing structure in Paris. So in part, it's a rescue mission, um, and in part, it's a show of might. Additionally, the Bastille holds guns and ammo. So those revolutionaries that storm the Bastille may come on a cache of weapons. Louis learns about the storming of the Bastille the next day, and he asks his advisors if it was a riot. His advisor said no, it was a revolution. In addition to the storming of the Bastille, France is suffering from bad crop yields, and grain becomes super expensive. Because of this, it becomes difficult for women and for bakers who 
make bake bread for the French people to make the flour that they have stretched throughout famine. Because of this, the common folk go after the king and queen, and this march, led by women, 7,000 of them, um, decided to show their distaste for the king and queen, another revolutionary act leading up to uh, the French Declaration of Rights, Man and Citizen. The differences between the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen and the Declaration of Independence are kind of interesting. So it definitely borrows from the Declaration of Independence, but maybe it corrects some things that were left out. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen says, The representatives of the French people, constituted as a national assembly, and considering that ignorance, neglect, or contempt of the rights of man are the sole causes of public misfortunes and governmental corruption, have resolved to set forth in a solemn declaration the natural, inalienable, and sacred rights of man. So, so far, it sounds pretty similar. So that by being constantly present to all the members of the social body, this declaration may always remind them of their rights and duties so that by being liable at every moment to comparison with the aim and all political institutions, the acts of the legislative and executive powers may be more fully respected, and so that by being founded henceforth on simple and incontestable principles, the demands of the citizens may always tend toward maintaining the constitution and general welfare." In consequence, the National Assembly recognizes and declares in the presence and under the auspices of the Supreme Being the following rights of man and citizen. So here we can see that they're calling out, just as the Americans did, those powers that have been corrupted and putting in writing how they would like their government to go henceforth. Here are just a few of the rights that they've listed. There are additional 15 articles after these three. The first, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions may be based only on common utility. The purpose of all political association is the preservation of the natural and imprescribable rights of man. Imprescriptible, sorry, rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. Three, the principle of all sovereignty rests essentially in the nation. No body and no individual may exercise authority which does not emanate expressly from the nation. So here, they've addressed things a little differently. You remember, in the Declaration of Independence, the three things listed were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Here, the French are getting slightly more specific. So this declaration is written, uh, kicking off the French Revolution, and again, it echoes the Declaration of Independence. Um, Lots of fighting happens, and eventually the radical Jacobians in power, um, or rather being sort of spearheading the revolutionary efforts, um, win. And they sit down to, at a constitutional convention to outline the new constitution of France. This group is led by a figure called Maximilien Robespierre, and he is a fervent revolutionary. He wants to establish a republic of virtue. And in this republic, he instated all sorts of rules um, that got rid of anything really related to the monarchy, even so far as getting rid of the king and queen cards from the deck of cards. He also was not a huge fan. The Jacobians weren't a huge fans of religion. So they converted churches to temples of reason and changed the calendar, which is based on uh, the Gregorian calendar, based on religious rulership to start with the first day of the Republic. They tried and executed all sorts of enemies of the revolution. They executed peasants and nobles and workers and even other revolutionaries who questioned their methods. Louis XV tried to flee, but he was eventually gotten a hold of and tried for treason. He too was executed. Now you may be aware that the preferred method of execution in this era was by guillotine. And Maximilien Robespierre is considered the leader of what's called a reign of terror because of how frequently he used this guillotine. It's said that six, over 16,000 were 
executed by guillotine in this era. So perhaps Robespierre was a little out of control. Um, eventually, other countries start to align against the revolutionaries because of Robespierre's behavior. And in an effort to maintain their street cred, basically, the revolutionaries decide to stick Robespierre in the guillotine. And his day is done, too. Now, all of these things impact neoclassical art and architecture. This is a returned interest in the classics, so ancient Rome, ancient Greece. And here we'll see some of that same balance and order and perfect ge geometry and perfect form that we saw in those other cultures and what we saw in the Renaissance. And part of it is inspired by the revolutionary movements, but part of it is also inspired by the recent uncovering of Pompeii. So Pompeii is the city that was uh, buried in ash after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, and uh, archaeologists in this period have uncovered tons of Roman artifacts here. And all of this is sensational, and there's a new awareness of classical art, and it's just very stylish to be interested in Rome at this time. Additionally, the ancients, like the revolutionaries, wanted to balance emotion and restraint. Um, so here the revolutionaries are looking for that sort of thing too. They don't want the excesses that came before, the excesses of Rococo and Baroque. Instead, they want things to be austere, they want things to be serious, they want things to be ordered. And often the neoclassical art and architecture calls for patriotism and liberty. And these are things that were very important to ancient Rome and likewise to ancient Greece. As I mentioned, they rejected those excesses that came before and preferred the dignity and order of classical forms. And this comes through in the statuesque poses of visual arts, in the orderly decoration of architectural structures, from the use of primary and darker colors, things that are much more staid and subdued, and from the austere construction of, of public buildings. So these neoclassical forms are the forms that we see in Washington, D.C., in uh, what we see when we look at a lot of early American architecture. So one example of neoclassical visual arts is the artwork of Jacques-Louis David. Um, David, first of all, just take a look at this. Does this look anything like Rococo? The color schemes completely different. The lines are completely different. And here we have a callback to antiquity as David is representing um, Roman Republican soldiers. So this was painted originally for Louis the Sixteenth, um, because neoclassicism appealed to the monarchy as well. It was a way for them to show off control and order. But we know that inside things like Versailles, inside, um, were completely ornate and overdone. So the inner worlds were much more uh, frivolous than the outer worlds. The story de being depicted here is a story of Roman soldiers, and they're united in opposition to tyranny. Here, the brothers are swearing to their father to protect the state, even if that means they have to go against their personal interests. One of the daughters, off to the right, is engaged to an enemy, uh, an enemy soldier, so the brothers know that they may have to kill their sister's fiancé, but they'll do that because that's what they owe to the Republic. So here there is a tension between civic duty and personal interests. Um, this is probably comparing the French Revolution to the Roman Republic in that they will fight in order to defend the freedom, the liberty of individual um, autonomy. And Louis did not get the subtext at all. There's definitely a revolutionary air to this, and he had no idea. So the painting was officially accepted and displayed prominently. Um, to Louis, it promoted morality in France, but it, it's really sort of revolutionary propaganda. Here, perhaps, you can see some of those elements of neoclassical art that I mentioned before, the primary colors, um, the uh, callback to antiquity with the rounded Roman arches in the back of the room. The scenes are not cluttered or frivolous in any way. 
the poses are statuesque and the lines, unlike the stark diagonals, the dramatic diagonals or the, the freely curves of Rococo, um, here we have lots of straight lines and much more geometric com composition in general. Neoclassicism also can be seen in architecture, as I mentioned. Um, this here is the state capitol at Richmond, Virginia, and the architect of this building is Thomas Jefferson. Perhaps you've heard of him. He uh, helped draft the Declaration of Independence. He was the governor of Virginia. He was the U.S. Minister to France. He was the Secretary of State. He was the Vice President, and eventually he was also the President. So in addition to all of these things, Jefferson was a master architect. Um, he disliked most of the models of architecture that surrounded him at this time. Uh, one time when talking about houses in Virginia, he said, it's impossible to devise things that are more ugly, uncomfortable, and happily more perishable. So he definitely wanted to create something new, but he definitely looked back to antiquity when he created it. Here we can see some modeling that is very familiar. The buildings each have pediments, things that we would have seen in ancient Greek or Roman temples, and that we saw again in the Renaissance. Uh, furthermore, each of the buildings emphasizes sort of perfect geometry with squares and triangles, and incorporates porticos as we would have seen on Roman temples once again, and uh, ionic columns which were adopted from ancient Greece. Even the layout of these buildings is symmetrical and balanced, and all of this is neoclassicism at its finest. Now, classical music borrows some of this order, structure, simplistic form as well. Classical music was preceded by something called style galant. So the style galant was very popular in the early 18th century. This was uh, prominent at aristocratic venues, at salons, and very often featured something called the harpsichord. The harpsichord is a stringed instrument that looks a little bit like a piano and sounds a little bit like a harp. Um, and it's often very ornate and accompanies uh, ballet dancers and things of that sort. Classical music kind of breaks with these excesses that are very much associated with the Rococo lifestyle. Now, it's important that we distinguish between the general definition of classical music and the technical definition of classical music. Very often, when people think of classical music, they think of any old instrumental uh, symphonic work, right? But here specifically, we're talking about music that veers away from Baroque excess and looks for balance and order. <clears throat> here are some specific differences between Baroque music, which we've already studied, and classical music. So Baroque music uses a smaller orchestra than classical music does. It also incorporates more strings and, of course, that harpsichord. If you remember, Baroque music was very much about showing off and improvisation and drama. And uh, the artists were creating polyphonic works that were meant for virtuosos. They also incorporated related musical themes um, and then just used that one theme to be sort of the organizing principle throughout the work. In classical music, there's a larger orchestra, but that orchestra is standardized. And in addition to those stringed instruments, they incorporate uh, newer, innovative instruments. So there's more brass, there are more wind instruments, and the pianoforte is created at around this time, which is a much more strong, um, which is what forte means. It's a much stronger sound than the harpsichord. There are more rules to structure classical music. It's uh, more simplistic in its melodic form, and there are contrasting musical themes, but again, it's all very ordered. Here's an image of what a classical symphony orchestra might look like, and you can see many, many strings still, um, but here, right in the middle, uh, sort of wedged into all of that, so many wind and brass and percussion instruments. <clears throat> Now, the classical symphony is using that standardized orchestra and also a standardized form. The standard classical symphonic form is called the sonata form, and the sonata form is made up of four movements. Each movement is a self-contained section of music. The first mu movement is usually fast and complex, and it introduces uh, the major th themes for the piece. The second movement is usually slow and lyrical, and it 
draws out the emotional and the musical implications of that theme. The third movement is a minuet or a stately dance, so it's adding some order back into the composition. And the fourth movement is a spirited conclusion that's really kind of all of those themes culminating into one wrap it all up um, conclusion. So each movement sets out musical themes, melodies, moods, develops them, and then summarizes them at the end. All of this, again, very organized, and you'll probably notice um, more easy, more easily parsed as far as which instruments are, uh, which voices are meant to be prominent. So the father of symphony is Haydn. Haydn, um, he established the reverence of an artist in society. So he was a man about town. Um, he was a court musician for a wealthy family on a remote estate. And he was generally isolated from other composers and trends in music until the latter part of his life. So because of this, he says he was forced to become original. He had to uh, come up with his own form. And what he does is distinctly classical. He was very successful in his time, and he had a public life that exemplified him as the ideal enlightenment man. He had good character and worldly success. Um, he was modest and he was honest, and all of this aided in the favorable reception of his music. Addi additionally, rather, he was prolific. He wrote over 100 symphonies in his lifetime, and he was popular in his lifetime. He experimented with all musical forms, and he is, again, um, considered the father of symphony. If you listen to his symphony number 80, you can hear something of that order and control that comes with the sonata form. Unfortunately, I'm not able to incorporate music in this, uh, this lecture, but I'm going to work on that for future lectures. Another important musical figure is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. I'm fairly certain you've heard of him. He had a very early musical prowess. He could play violin and piano and had begun to compose at just the age of six. His father was a musician for the Archbishop of Salzburg, and because of this, Mozart traveled with his father and was exposed to a number of musical styles. It said that you can almost tell where he was when he wrote pieces because he had an ear for what was stylish wherever he happened to be staying at the time. Nonetheless, he mastered new forms of music and incorporated those influences in an interesting and unique way. After the Archbishop of Salzburg dies and the new Archbishop comes in, that one is not a fan of Mozart. Mozart decides to leave and the parting is not friendly. See, Mozart is considered a genius, but what's not known about him is that he was also pretty tactless. He was arrogant and he had a strange sense of humor and he was just generally an asshole. So because of this, he is not popular and not wealthy in his own lifetime. Um, he dies in debt and at the age of 36 and not in any sort of affluence as far as his family or his personal life are concerned. However, we recognize him, him we, uh, we recognize him now for his virtuosity. Um, he was a conductor, a pianist, an organist, a violinist. He wrote sonatas, concertos, symphonies, and even operas, composing over 600 works in his lifetime. Now, many musicians or um, composers since Mozart look back at his works as overly complex, especially consider the, considering the era in which he's composing. Uh, but his works are certainly interesting, and they do adhere to that sonata form, though they do push the boundaries of that form. A couple of pieces by him that you might want to check out are Symphony No. 40. Um, this is one that he wrote towards the end of his life, but it has clear, recognizable melodies. Even though it's incorporating a lot of voices, they do have a singular purpose, and it's not that sort of Baroque, polyphonic show-off. He also composed Symphony No. 40, incidentally, in just eight weeks. In addition to symphonies, he wrote lots of sonatas, and Piano Sonata No. 11 has a complexity of mood, it has a recurring theme, and it varies ever so slightly as it switches between each of the three movements within the sonata. Even one of the movements in the sonata is a march. So he's playing with that sonata form, but in this case, with a sonata, which is a piece of music that is composed for a single instrument. <laughs> 
And that is neoclassicism and classical music. Some things to consider as you think about this lecture, um, that the thinkers and the artists and the musicians of this era are opting for order rather than opulence. And they're calling back to classical forms as they institute their own republics and their own democracies in this new revolutionary era. <laughs>